duck run, inoculating mushroom logs, planting forest gardens, all kinds of things like that. We actually install those with the class as part of it. Landowner clients pay into the class uh, an affordable fee. Students pay tuition. Everyone gets a better deal. We get amazing permaculture sites, you know, visible, and it kind of moves along like that. So it's kind of an engine we hope for um, really uh, increasing the, the scale and effectiveness of permaculture in the community. And so part of that for us was, you know, we want to get uh, people together and talk about what does it look like to do permaculture as a community not just as little backyard projects, but in a way that's gonna really affect a lot of people, really change a lot of lives, really do a lot of good in the community. And so that's what this panel is about. With that, I wanna hand it over to Dylan. We also recognize that permaculture is a design course for creating a sustainable society or a regenerative human culture, then it has to happen on a bigger scale than the backyard. It has to happen on the community scale. And so as the founder of the transition movement once said, uh, actually I said many times when he quoted, his name is Rob Hopkins. This is a, a movement that is spreading permaculture all over the world globally at a community scale. And he uses this to justify this model. He says, if we wait for governments to act, and he's talking about responses to the global crises that we face, like food shortages and climate change and um, rising fuel costs and things like this. He says, if we, if we wait for governments to act, it will likely be too little and too late. If we act as individuals, it will be too little. But if we act as a community, it might be just enough, just in time. So we created this community scale permaculture event to really kind of highlight those issues and those ideas. And at the same time, to try to provide a forum for these excellent, amazing movers and shakers that are so active in our community, in our in Asheville and surrounding areas, who are doing amazing things in the world and to help them get the word out about the things that they're doing and share their successes and share their challenges and share their needs for support and help. The people up here, not all of them call themselves professional permaculturalists, but they're all doing things in our estimation that are this whole systems thinking where they're linking things up, making connections between people in the community or in landscapes linking it all up so that everything can work together, like the social parallel of what Dylan is saying with the chickens in the orchard. And so we want to broaden this awareness and say permaculture is just one word for, for this whole system's design and thinking. We think it's a particularly potent way of learning how to do that, but there are a lot of people doing it, and we want to um, focus on the people in the community who are thinking that way, who aren't just working on a, on a, on a tunnel vision project but are actively working to connect with other people in the community, with other things that need to happen so that everything can work together in that synergistic way. So it's really exciting to us to bring people in who are working in that connective way, even if they don't call themselves professional permaculturalists, although Chuck definitely does and is. This is, you know, as, as Dylan says, I've been a veteran of the, the permaculture struggle since 1981. And it has been a struggle in North America because this was very infertile soil because we were too wealthy. And uh, that shifted and the interest in permaculture has bloomed as the, you know, the world looks more grim all the time, the better permaculture looks as a, as a good solution to that. Uh, one of the things I've always loved about permaculture is basically that Permaculture, from my perspective, is common sense solutions applied on a whole system scale. And uh, so that's what's, what's really uh, happening, is we need to do that on a cultural level. And we have to take this beyond just food or energy or those kind of things to really look at this larger and broader kind of community context. That said, Food is probably the best organizing principle we've got because you can get agreement across ideologies and political belief systems and all those kind of things like that. So we need to use food as a uniting factor in this uh, work that we're doing as cultural change agents. Um, if you look on a historical level, if you look at civilizations and hum human, human societies' evolutions, a couple of things stood out to me along those kind of lines is the gardens trump agriculture every time that you can produce more food for less energy more locally and more nutrition with more diversity 
in a garden than any agricultural system out there. But I want to talk about this, where we are here at the Haywood Street Congregation, which is a you know, microcosm of the world in so many ways, even though it seems like an unusual church with an unusual mission of basically feeding people who are hungry. So every Wednesday, between 250 and 500 people are fed right here and in the adjacent room, uh, they're fed lunch. And there's not a requirement that they go to a service, but there's also a, an extraordinary service available upstairs after that. The emphasis here is on meeting people's needs. And one of those needs is that a lot of folks who are homeless or low income, um, don't have access to healthy food, or they can't afford, certainly, to buy organic food. So when we go outside, or you've probably been out there already, I want you to know, last summer, 700 pounds of organic produce came out of that little garden right there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dynamic governance. And I'm looking around the room, and I'm seeing people who have used it, experienced it in the Asheville Welcome Food Policy Council. Um, in Transition Asheville, in the Asheville Movement Collective, in the East-West Asheville Neighborhood Association, um, and Rosetta from Rosetta's Kitchen, they're, they're implementing dynamic governance throughout their whole business. Um, so it's something that I have been fortunate, um, and it hasn't even been a year yet, that I've been fortunate enough to be able to um, play a part in bringing this methodology out to our community and out to the broader world. And when you think about governance, you know, it's kind of one of those subjects people don't really like to think about very much. It's kind of like the idea of having meetings where you talk about how you should have meetings. Mm -hmm. And like those toast everybody, like please don't make us go through that. <laughs> but the truth is that how we make decisions together and how we organize our work and how we create roles and know who does what and who's accountable for what and what's our relationship to each other and who do you go to and who makes which decision. The, the clarity around that actually makes for a much better experience for us working together. We still have individuals, we still have a community that is definitely into finding a different way of living and being and just coming together in that way, and one of our things that we um, that we find in um, in common with with all of us is growing food. Um, since our community garden has been there, there have been other people in our community had, that has taken it upon themselves to start their own little gardens in their lawns. Um, before um, Hillcrest Unity Garden came about, nobody period on the hill was growing food until um, till the garden came and then you have other individuals that are growing food and um, mainly um, elderly because they can't get down to the location of the garden but um, we are looking to extend that to have as many people in our community growing food right in their front or um, little back plots, yards, I guess you can say. Three sisters. Now there's about 50 people who have gotten rid of their lawns in this neighborhood and, that, and it's filled with food production. That's a culture shift. It happens to, when you have inspiring, you know, solutions that people can see and replicate. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as going outside and doing exactly that. So that shifts culture. Gardens are a great model for shifting culture. It's about horticulture and how, you know, if, if, in the same way that we cultivate plants, we can cultivate souls and spirits and personalities and, and uh, communities of change. One of the, in, in thinking about how we get to that change as quickly as possible, the Food Policy Council's uh, through their efforts, wrote and helped to pass the City of Asheville Food Action Plan. This happened in January. The City of Asheville now has a food action plan for the first time. Woo! 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 And I want to read a couple of, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but there's a couple of pieces I want you to hear, because I want you to hear the guiding language for your government in this city now. 
The city of Asheville believes that all citizens should have access to healthy, nutritious food and that our community should be able to sustain its nutritional needs year-round with regionally grown, processed, and stored healthy food. The, the Asheville Bug and Food Policy Council defines healthy food as grown locally through organic and permaculture principles from seeds, plants, and animals that are not genetically modified and in a manner that builds the fertility of the soil. Woo! Woo! <laughs> um, and it means a lot. And, and if you see the city not following its own rules, you need to say, hey city, you just said this other thing. <laughs>